Chip, Martin, it's great to see you again and here to look at everything Cayman today. How are you both? Yeah, very good. Thanks, Becca. Um, good to be with you and uh, good morning from uh, the Cayman Islands. Oh, yeah, you had to add that in, didn't you? <laughs> Chip. Yeah, of, of course you did. Good morning to both of you. Uh, you know, it's our it's another opportunity to be envious of where he is and compared to the the dreariness of here. Although we do have the leaves turning currently, so uh, it's not not quite as warm, but it is very pretty. Right. So I don't I don't want to hear any more about the Cayman Islands apart from the financial stuff. Thank you, Martin. So uh, no more about the sunshine or whatever. <laughs> but, so so I, come on. What are the hot topics going on in Cayman now? I'd say I'd say the hot topics are um, uh, are ma- mainly um, around the um the restructuring officer regime which was introduced um just over a year ago now in uh in the cayman islands legislation um and um i can provide an update on what's going on there uh generally uh, cross-border insolvencies um and where that's at and the uh, uh the challenges between uh operating in different jurisdictions and seeking recognition etc um, Chinese real estate debt has been um, a significant um, uh, significant provider of work for um, uh, for uh, Cayman Islands attorneys and, um, and and practitioners over here. And then the whole uh, noise around uh, digital assets, especially the exchanges, um, the cryptocurrency failures, etc. So those are the the main four that uh, we've seen in the past year the restructuring officer regime that's been now going for a year so tell us how's it gone over the last year and and give us some examples of when it's been used so just a very brief recap because i know there's been a lot of coverage on it um the restructuring officer regime was introduced into our companies act um at the very end of august 2022 um and the purpose of it was to provide a a rescue um restructuring mechanism um that was um uh in order to to enable companies that were financially indebted, uh, were struggling, um, were were financially viable, but needed some form of restructuring to benefit from a um, a process, a moratorium that's put in place to allow them to to carry out that restructuring. And importantly, um, up to that point, we only really had the use of liquidation um, to to effect that. But obviously, when you're looking to do a restructuring, um, you don't want to, the end goal is to rescue the company, it's not to put it into liquidation. So uh, that that commenced, um, so just over a year ago. There hasn't been a huge amount of activity, which has been somewhat surprising. Um, there have only been, to my knowledge, two uh, um, uh, petitions that have led to restructuring officer appointments. Um, one was Rockley Photonics, the other was uh, Reoriente. Um, And there have been other petitions that have been lodged for restructuring officers, but they've either either been withdrawn uh, before uh, the uh, the hearing or they've been um, they've been denied by the courts. Um, And most of those uh, denials of 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 those orders have been because the the restructuring plan uh, that's required um, is either not not developed enough. There's not enough. Uh, meat on the bone to the to the restructuring plan, um, or alternatively, it's not viable. So the court has decided that, uh, um, notwithstanding the um, the petitioners' views, the actual the actual restructuring is isn't viable. So there's been some activity, um, but it hasn't been um, it hasn't been super busy on 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 filings, which is what we thought we might see, but hasn't come to pass yet. Is that what you expected, Chip? as well so it's it's been i think really interesting it's it's definitely added the, the additional arrow to the quiver um i think we've seen it considered quite a bit it's been tried and tested as martin said as a few times it's been thought about and started or stopped or just not started uh, you know i think that the like any new regime you know as folks sort of roll it around and get get a good taste for it um, they'll figure out where it's most useful. Um, and that, of course, is also going to be impacted by what happens globally. You know, we're going to talk about a couple of the interesting things popping through here. Um, but I think, uh, you know, most most of the, the leading prognosticators anticipate some sort of a, of a real recession, global slowdown um, coming up 
soon, maybe yet this year, maybe early first quarter next year. And, you know, when those things happen, uh, there's always more opportunity for these sorts of solutions to be figured out. So I think as, as it gets better known, as it's been getting better known, and as the economy calls for it, um, yeah, I, I think it's it's going to be added in as intended as an additional arrow in the quiver. It'll be used as part of a a global restructuring of a of a group. So in the example of uh, of, of Rockley, um, which um, was a um, uh, was a, a, a company that developed um, sensors in, in smartwatches. Uh, that um, that was done in parallel with a, a US Chapter 11 filing. Um, so there was a restructuring uh, in the US via Chapter 11, and then there was a restructuring in Cayman via the restructuring officer. So I think that's where we'll see it predominantly be used going forward. So, I mean, Chip, m- moving on to the sort of cross-border group insolvencies, do you want to talk to us about that and what's been going on in, in that area? Boy, a lot of a lot of interesting actions. Um, they're, they're sort of also on Martin's list there. But, you know, a lot of it is is around the, the conflict between do we take a global approach, do we take a discrete approach by jurisdiction, um, and I think, you know, for, for a bit of time, that universal approach, certainly promulgated by the World Bank and Insol and some of the big bodies, has, has really been the uh, the soup du jour, if you will, the flavor folks have been leaning towards. Um, what we're finding, though, recently is some pretty significant cases where uh, it starts to matter which jurisdiction you're in based on how proceeds are going to be distributed, uh, I think that's that's some of the the, the hotter things that I'm seeing right now uh, going on. There's been some some interesting cases that Martin can touch on too about how uh, priorities figured out in different cases where there's fraud involved. And so again, all sort of touching on on distribution type elements, um, you know, and because folks are starting to think about the end of the case now. At the beginning of the case, you're also starting to see some more interesting fights over Comey and jurisdiction and where do you want these things heard and, and all of this sort of thing. So that's sort of the, the I think that the highlight that I'm starting to see is some real cracks in the concept of universalism because of the distributions at the end. I, I certainly agree. Yeah, and the, the um, we're starting to see some. Uh, disagreements on on Comey and some and some different um, courts taking different approaches to uh, to the Comey test um, and, uh, and and touching on the the point that Chip made on the distribution side of things. Um, there's a couple of couple of ongoing cases that that are different but have similarities. One is uh, called TCA fund and the other is is direct lending. Um, both of which have Cayman connections and U.S. connections, but both have been have been dealt with in in slightly different ways. Um, both U.S. receiverships and and both Cayman liquidations. And um, the the challenges in a U.S. receivership uh, where the distribution is is based on equitable principles, um, the distribution mechanism in Cayman is very much on a, on a stri- uh, on a statutory strict priority basis. Um, which which um, the courts can't can't deviate. So um, that that throws up some interesting conflict of law points. Um, and there are some cases going through uh, our courts here in Cayman and in the US um, that are trying to sort of sort that out. So I mean, let's move on to the Chinese real estate debt because I mean, there's been quite a lot going on with this. First thing to say is the numbers, um, the debt numbers are absolutely staggering. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the uh, China Evergrande is um, uh, is a significant uh, one of those. I mean, China Evergrande um, is possibly the largest Chinese real estate uh, developer, um, and um, it has a, three, a debt pile of three hundred and forty billion dollars, uh, which is is quite eye watering. Uh, that's currently going through a, a restructuring. Has been going on for some time. Um, there are parallel schemes in that case in uh, in the Cayman Islands, in Hong Kong, uh, and in the BBI, uh, which is seeking to restructure 20 billion of uh, of New York uh, governed New York law governed debt uh, out of that total debt pile, um, and that is one where 
um, the US uh, bankruptcy courts are being involved. Uh, there's a, there was a, a US Chapter 15 filing uh, for recognition of the, um, the Hong Kong and the BVI schemes recently, uh, which, um, to my knowledge, is still still to be heard. But that one's out there. Um, and then going back a bit further, you had uh, you had Modern Land. Uh, Modern Land was a um, another Chinese uh, real estate developer and, and property investor. Um, that was um, uh, restructured via a Cayman scheme. Um, there was also U.S. Chapter 15 recognition um, and a, a, of New York law governed debt, um, and a and a, um, a helpful judgment from the um, New York courts uh, on compromise of uh, of New New York law governed debt using a, a Cayman Island scheme of arrangement. So. Um, and there are plenty of others out there. I mean, we're seeing uh, on the advisory side, we're seeing um, a lot of um, lot of work on potential restructurings uh, where there's Chinese debt um, in these structures where, the, uh, where Cayman Islands is involved. I'm interested in this because you talk about, um, we talked before about the cross-border insolvencies and sort of how you dis- distinguish between sort of discrete and global. With these big property things i mean obviously that issue must also apply do you think this is something that's going to have to be looked at in the longer term this this whole issue about whether things are de- dealt with locally or globally as as businesses become more global i think it's going to be look i'm not sure we're going to see a a precedent that covers everything i think you're going to see some territorialism you know um, mm-hmm. chinese investment um chinese insolvencies a lot of times end up with the Chinese government owning the business at the end of it. Yeah. You know, there's not a kind of a bailout regime. It's not exactly that, but mm-hmm. lots of times the solution is for the party to take over the thing. Um, and so when you start talking about these huge properties like this, if it's in China, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, are they going to be able to take control over that kind of property in New York um, and in the U S and other places? Um, you know, perhaps legally, yes. Perhaps practically, you know, that's a that's a political matter. You start seeing policy come into play with these some with these sorts of things, and I don't know where you're going to end up. Um, I think you're going to have some scraps. Um, there's literally live debates. Uh, there's an appeals case going on in the TCA matter right now, and you know, we'll see where where it all goes. There's enough money at stake that these are the sorts of things that could make its way in the U.S. to the Supreme Court. So let's move on to sort of digital asset and, ex- and the crypto issues. We've had AAX, FTX. I mean, where does it end? <laughs> it just seems to keep going, doesn't it? Do you want to talk about that, Chip? You know, one of the one of the beauties and one of the problems with everything crypto is new, unregulated, starting to get regulated, um, inconsistently regulated. Uh, it creates tremendous opportunities for good and bad. Right. And so uh, where it's where it's been good, uh, there's been a lot of good advantage to it. It's been uh, a useful investment vehicle, something easily portable. Um, also a problem because it's an investment vehicle. It's easily portable. You know, you can have your crypto in a, in a, in a wallet and a flash drive that's encrypted. And um, whether uh, something innocently happens to you um, or something, you know, you, you don't want to give up the the, the encryption code, you know, you've got a lot of wealth tied up in these different things. So um, to start with, no surprise that there's some growing pains with crypto. Um, Then you start working into, all right, you know, every time that there's something new, there are folks who take advantage of it, right? There's these, uh, the Ponzi schemes, which simply can use crypto as another, another tool in their, their Ponzi uh, portfolio. Um, there are the legitimate funds that just go bad because when you have something with value as volatile as crypto, that can happen, um, especially if you have volatility causing values to be low when demands for cash redemptions pop up. And that's the, I, I think, what has gotten most of these folks into trouble where they've either had legitimate trouble or they've gotten caught because of their their not so great actions is because when they have needed to redeem investors, when they've had to pay back things, the cash just hasn't been there. And the 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 spiel here always is that's a timing difference, right? That it's just unlucky that the day we needed the cash, the cash wasn't there. If we just had held on a little bit, uh, it had come back and, you know, all of these sorts of things. But um, it, it probably is the what I think is the start of the maturation 
of the crypto markets, both because these events are coming up. But now what was, I would say, unbridled enthusiasm for especially the younger generations to to get into crypto, um, they're starting to see what it looks like to get wiped out. I agree with Chip. I think this is the um, the early stages of uh, the development of, of cryptocurrencies. I think, I think undoubtedly cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Um, but when you have uh, little or, or no regulation, um, it's not surprising that the majority of these failures are, are, are um, trading platforms uh, rather than the cryptocurrencies themselves. They're at their exchanges that have that have gone bust. Um, obviously, there's plenty of coverage around the FTXs, um, the um, uh, the uh, Voyager, Celsius, um, Three Arrows Capital, etc. Um, and uh, and significant aspects of uh, of either fraud or mismanagement um, in these um, in these cases. So that's not that's not a surprise. Um, it is hitting a lot of the uh, offshore jurisdictions uh, on the basis that uh, many of the uh, service providers um, are, are based here um, on the basis of the, um, the, the tax neutrality of offshore jurisdictions. Um, but it's uh, it, it's here to here to stay for sure, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more and more of it. Um, and, um, and cryptocurrencies will continue to be used. So overall, these the issues we've talked about so far, they're, they've all been about the Cayman Islands. Do you think these are issues that are affecting other parts of the world? These are all global. These are entirely global issues um, based on where the, uh, the, the the economic climate is in in many of the major major countries of the world. Um, it's not surprising that um, this is this is happening happening everywhere. Um, you know, real estate is in. Um, is is under pressure all over the place, not just in in China, um, in Europe and the UK. Um, it's also an issue. Um, there's a lot of uh, credit funds out there uh, that um, for years have been uh, um, have been fine on the basis that the interest rates have have been low, but now we're starting to see some of those come under a bit of pressure. The, and so the distra- distressed debt investors are, um, are coming heavily back into the market. So. All of these issues are um, are, are global in nature. And do you think people look at the Cayman Islands and, uh, you know, to to see things that are going on? Do you think how big do you think the Cayman Islands are seen as on on the global stage and these types of issues happening there? It's interesting because the Cayman Islands get a bum rap a little bit, right? You know, they people remember Johnny Depp and the Pirates of the Caribbean. I think Martin's got a peg leg and a a hat and what you mean he doesn't? (laughs) <laughs> nah, not only on the weekends. Or they think about the movie The Firm, and they think about you know, um, you know the 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 way it's portrayed down there. You see, you know, these allegations of these buildings holding thousands of shell companies and all that. And so that's in a lot of ways some of the public perception. The reality is, Cayman's a very sophisticated jurisdiction. They've got great professionals. They got a great judiciary. Um, a very well-developed company's law that's dealt with all of these sorts of things. And so, you know, I think that the people who are in the know, I think, look at Cayman. They see the the worldwide issues being played out there. And it's actually a pretty good jurisdiction for an awful lot of those issues, not the least of which having having hearings in Cayman is never a bad thing. You hope, the, <laughs> you hope a trial goes on a long time if you if you have to come on island. Um but uh, but they have the right people and they have the specialists and, and they don't have people who aren't specialists doing this stuff. That's one of the things you get into the big cities in, in the U.S. or the U.K. And, you know, you can have people who hop into these big insolvency cases who it's the first time ever or not very often. You know, you look at, at someone like Martin, for example, and I'll, I'll bet you you've got hundreds of liquidation appointments um, as opposed to just a couple that, that you might have in what do you both think we're going to see in the year ahead for the Cayman Islands? You know, I, I do think it's going to get busy. I, I think that, unfortunately, there's just so many stresses in the global economy, you know, whether it's um, the things going on with the UAW strike in the U.S., which could have, have global repercussions, right? If they get what they want, uh, there could be a lot more offshoring. You could have a lot of things mothballed. If they don't get what they want, it could bring things back into the U.S. You see um, the 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 issues in the Ukraine and in Israel and not sure how those things are going to fall out. The, the challenges China's got, we haven't talked much about the, the 
Belt and Road Initiative, but you know a lot of those investments are are coming due, and some of those are tied up in what we have spoken about. But I just think there's a lot of there's a reckoning to be coming, and I think it's coming uh, in 2024. You see the real estate market bubble looking a lot like 2007 and eight. All of these things point towards. Um, some activity. And, you know, there's one of the things we don't talk about very much is, you know, there was a there was a point at which I think I saw something like 10 per, I think Cayman was the 10th largest country in terms of the, the, the amount of money that flowed through it in the world. This might have gone back seven or eight years. I'm not sure where the ranking is now, but but we forget it's, it's not London, but 10th is pretty big. That's an awful lot of activity. And if you just have a small amount of that that's troubled and needs restructuring, um, you know, that's a huge, huge wave hitting the beaches of Cayman. <laughs> what do you reckon, Martin? I think the, I think the interest rates um, is a, uh, is a major uh, factor in, uh, in the, the volume of, of restructuring insolvency work and interest rates um, were at record low levels for a decade or more. And uh, are now no longer at those levels, and are, and are, are consistently um, a lot higher. And so, um, corporates and groups will come under pressure on their on their debt structures um, to to service service that debt uh, via these interest repayments. So, I think that the, the interest rates, um, if if they uh, continue to stay where they are for the foreseeable future, which it appears that they they will do. Um, are going to are going to buy it, and we'll see more activity as a result. Good. Well, that's great to see you both, and thank you very much for your time today. So, if anybody wants to get um, in touch with you, is LinkedIn the best place or the website, Martin? Uh, yeah, both. So, Martin Trot, um, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, rnhrestructuring.com is our website. What about you, Chip? Where can people reach you? They can get me on LinkedIn as well at Chip Holbacky or at Chip dot hobacky at raymond.com r-e-h-m-a-n-n.com is the website that's brilliant well thank you very much guys and have a really great rest of the day all right thank you thank you thanks becca thanks jeff